Good morning, Interweb. Warbler's Log 32. We've done it. We've reached the future. It is 2024. So I just want to start by wishing everyone a very happy new year. All the best for 2024. May health and happiness and prosperity shine upon you all. Now, for this video, we're going to do a really short one today. I would basically just want to wrap up precipitation. I've made changes. I know, really out of character. I want to go over those changes so we can clear the decks and get on to temperature mapping in the next video. But first, a quick note on the website. It's been updated. Got some new Vanga Van Gogh artwork here for the ocean currents. I think these look really beautiful. So shout out Vanga Van Gogh. They are open for commission. So if ever you need some ideally spec bio artwork done, Vanga's your man. Links in all the usual places. Now you're going to need to have watched the previous video. Otherwise, none of this is going to make any sense. Assuming you've done that, recall we left off having created these precipitation maps. And also recall that I was kind of fretting about the dryness of the world. I had an inkling I was probably being a little bit too conservative with the precipitation. And boy, did comments confirm that. Basically, everyone was like, yeah, way too conservative. You got to be more liberal with the old precipitation there, pal. And everyone was perfectly correct. So what I did was I spent the Christmas updating these maps. And I have some newer maps that look like this. Here are the old ones. And here are the newer ones. The only difference between the old maps and new maps is that I applied Worldbuilding Pasta's methodology, links in all the usual places, just very liberally. Like if it was even remotely possible to get precipitation in the area, no matter how marginal, I plonked it down. And these are the results. Shock horror, things get wetter. I mean, just compare old Janar to new Janar here. It's essentially been waterboarded. It's that much wetter, which is great. I was happy with that. And that was going to be the end of the story until I received the comment from an actual geographer. Shout out Ross Bay Geo. It's a long comment here, so I'll just leave it on screen. You can pause and have a read of it. It intrigued me so much that I reached out to Ross Bay Geo via email. We had a back and forth, a Zoom call, etc. I learned a lot. And Ross was kind enough to provide another set of precipitation maps, leveraging their expertise. So here they are compared to what I had come up with. And I think the first thing one should notice is that they are remarkably similar. There are differences, sure, but they're not like night and day differences. And I think that really is a testament to the strength of World Building Pasta's methodology. The experts agree. Nevertheless, differences there are. So I'd like to spend this video basically talking about those differences, what new information has been brought to the table and how I might change my methodology going forward for future projects. And hopefully that might help some of you guys out too. The two big differences that stuck out to me between Worbling Past stuff and Ross's stuff is the inclusion of sea effect precipitation and the change to the pressure and circulation regime. So let's go over those two. First, sea effect precipitation. So recall that in World Building Pasta's methodology, he very often has you place precipitation up to 2000 kilometers inland in the downwind direction. Now that's totally cool for when you have a large open ocean, but if you had a smaller inland sea or lake, for example, that doesn't really work. Like for example, here we have two coastlines, a body of water in between, and this body of water is about 200 kilometers wide. It'd be a bit weird for this wind here to dump precipitation 2,000 kilometers inland. And this is where sea effect precipitation comes in. Essentially, as a general rule of thumb, if you have a fetch that is greater than 100 kilometers, then the distance precipitation proceeds inland is equal to the fetch. So what is a fetch? A fetch is essentially the distance air travels unimpeded over water. So in this instance here, we have a fetch of 200 kilometers. And given this rule of thumb, that means that inland, in a downwind direction, we can expect the first 200 kilometers of the land to receive precipitation. So I guess something like, roughly like this. All this area would receive sea effect precipitation. And to be a little bit more precise, maximum precipitation would fall in this area. We'll see later how some other weird things can occur. So in sum, Taking into account sea effect precipitation means that smaller bodies of water on your world will also contribute precipitation to the land. Measure the distances the air travels over a body of water. Whatever that distance is, apply precipitation inland up to that same amount. But don't exceed the 2000 kilometers inland that World Building Pasta advocates for, because the air won't be able to transport precipitation just infinitely far inland. 
Okay, so that's the first effect, and we can see that in play in Ross's maps. So here is Esri in Northern Hemisphere winter. We have a bunch of wind coming in this kind of direction in a sort of southeasterly motion. We'll talk circulation in a second. And we can see the sea effect precipitation occurring here. If we take, say, this distance here, you'll see that very roughly the precipitation extends inland by that same amount. Now, recall I said that's a kind of maximum precipitation. Notice that it kind of peters off until, again, the wind is coming this way, it hits a mountainous region, the air is forced upwards, and any remaining moisture that air may contain is forced to precipitate out. So you end up with this kind of like weird little precipitation pattern here. Not something I would have spotted on my own, so again, shout out Ross, thank you. You can also see the same thing happening with this inland sea, which is just really cool. So the final big change is the circulation patterns, specifically the air circulation patterns and pressure systems. Here is what we had following uh, World Building Pasta's guide. And here are the changes Ross made. Now you might look at this and go, oh boy, that's like a wholesale redoing of everything. That looks nothing like what came before. But it's, it actually is remarkably similar. Again, testament to the strength of World Building Pasta's stuff. Notice we have a high pressure zone of the ocean, one, two, three, four of them. Same thing in the Southern Hemisphere, four of them here. Notice we have high pressure over Esri here. This is the winter hemisphere. High pressure over Janar. If we compare that to world building pasta stuff, basically the same outputs occurred. One, two, three, four pressure systems in the northern hemisphere. Same four here in the southern hemisphere. High pressure over Janar. High pressure over Esri. The big difference here is that world building pasta simulates kind of low pressure zones with these front systems. Whereas Ross puts in kind of like air quotes, proper low pressure cyclones. And honestly, this is what most world building guides will kind of have you do or advocate for. And that's part of the reason why I was drawn to world building past this stuff, because I'd never seen this systems of fronts before. And I was intrigued to test it and see what the outputs were like. Boat methods are great, but I really like the cool circulation maps that this system gets you. Now, if you're intrigued by this and you want to make something very similar, Madeline James Wright has your back. In her air currents and pressure tutorial, links in the usual places, you'll find that if you follow the steps she outlines at the end of the process, you will end up with something that looks remarkably like what Ross had. We have these low and high pressure systems, sometimes forming cells, sometimes forming bands, gradation of pressure going on, very akin to what Ross had. Now, Madeline goes over it in her tutorial, but just to put it here, because it is kind of new information for this series, the guidelines around placing these low pressure systems are basically as follows. In the summer hemisphere, place your low pressure systems in the middle of large continents. The idea being that the continent, the land is being heated more than the surrounding ocean, thus creating a low pressure system. If you have a large area of high elevation where this low pressure system occurs, you'll basically end up with an Asiatic style monsoon effect. The bigger this region of high elevation or the higher the elevation, the more monsoony the monsoons will be. In the winter hemisphere, place your low pressure cyclones in the high latitudes next to sea or glacial ice. This is because the heat differential between the comparatively cold sea ice and the comparatively warm oceans creates these low pressure systems. And you can see that here. We've got this big slab of sea ice here. We have a low pressure system abutting the sea ice, low pressure system here. Same thing in the southern hemisphere. We have this sea ice here, but also we have this extremely cold land. Likely there's tons of glaciers there. Therefore, we have a low pressure system forming in this high latitude ocean. In the northern hemisphere, winds will spiral into these low pressure systems in a, I'm going to get this wrong, I always do, counterclockwise manner? Yeah, counterclockwise. And that's reversed in the southern hemisphere. Winds will spiral into the low pressure zones in a clockwise manner. And that fact alone will kind of rejigger the circulation pattern for the world and hence give rise to this somewhat different spread of precipitation. So those are the two big differences, sea effect precipitation and including low pressure zones in the pressure and wind circulation maps. Now at the end of this all, you might go, well, Edgar, that's great and all, but your world is still bone dry, like, come on. And again, that is totally fine. If the world is to be dry, it is to be dry. I just don't want it to be dry because of an error on my part. But I also want to use this opportunity to talk about just the size of planets, because in general, the bigger the planet, 
the drier the world will be. Because if you think about it, if you took Earth and scaled it up, the surface area of the continents would increase, but the max distance inland precipitation can occur would not increase. It would stay constant. Ergo, bigger worlds will have, assuming the same land to ocean ratio, will have bigger continents, ergo, drier continents. And that's what we find here. This world is a bigger world. It's kind of a super Earth. So things are drier. But I mean, also, we have strategically placed mountains that are just blocking all the precipitation. Which again, is fine. But I think going forward, were I to make another super art, I think I would probably try to create many small, almost like island-like continents. And that would help mitigate the sort of dry effect of large worlds. Or just make a, a very small world, and then everything is just extremely moist. All right, that is that. Hopefully short and sweet. I'm not sure how long I've been recording for. But I guess just to, to wrap things up in summation, Going forward for future projects, I think the method that kind of suits me the most based on this experimentation is that of Madeline James Wrights. She doesn't quantify things or she doesn't like she doesn't like numerically quantify things as much as world building pasta does. So I think I would supplement her methodology with pasta's numbers. And I think that would produce decent results. In terms of precipitation, I would follow world building pasta stuff, but also include Ross's sea effect precipitation in that. I think that's the ideal method. Again, at least based on this experimentation. Let me know your thoughts. Genuinely intrigued to see what you think. Or if you have any alternate methods floating around out there that I've not uh, been exposed to yet. Please let me know. All right, that is that. Bit of a teaser here, but next time we do temperature. Have a good one, folks. And until next time, Edgar out.